Chris the Bergeron zone. Don't forget the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. So kind of turning to our topic of the day, what are going to be the key points? Documenta in my mind, documentation is the top point. You know, as Arthur said, in the revisions to the CMS uh, manuals, and I'm going to contradict Arthur a little bit in terms of where he said, don't read the whole thing. Someone in your organization, if they are not already aware of, likely should be aware of, all of, the po all of the requirements imposed upon your facility by the manuals. Because and it's the really interesting. <laughs> 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 but it's, I want to emphasize that. Right, so. But the, the manuals are what govern how you can bill <laughs> Medicare, how you should be act interacting with Medicare, and you know, as part of participating with it, you're expected to know exactly what you're complying with. Um, again, the documentation is going to help you with justifying the need for the continued care. And then again, and this is why I said you should be aware of what the manual is, they guide you in terms of how you should be operating. You know, it's not just for, you know, CMS to be putting something out there and saying, oh, you know, we're putting out these thousand page long documents. But they're actually um, instructing how facilities should operate. And it's not just applicable to, you know, obviously there's, you can probably avoid some of the sections because you know some are specific to hospitals or physicians, but then the others are s specific to skilled nursing facilities. And there's a whole host of manuals. I think there's there's somewhere between 20 and 30 manuals, I believe. So it's you know I know it's, it can be burdensome, but there are very important aspects in each of those. Um, so that's kind of the what I want to do is scare everybody a little <laughs> bit today. <laughs> um, you know. My concern is that... Give them, give them the one example, the, 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 the recent case that somebody got whacked. Uh, yeah, so, well... Briefly, <laughs> briefly, because I'm, I'm staying on time, but yeah. I wanted just to get... It's a reality. Yeah, yeah so <laughs> the reason that I'm concerned about this is that you have... I monitor these developments every day, and at least three to five times a week, and that's probably a, a conservative minimum, I see reports of settlements where facilities have paid millions of dollars for violations. You know, it could be as simple as you have a medical director who comes in and you're not paying them or well, I can't imagine someone would come in and not want to get paid for their services, but you don't have an appropriate agreement in place. You know, from my view, the regulations, especially on the civil side, they lay out specific elements of exactly what needs to be there to be in compliance. And if you're missing one of those elements, you're out of compliance. And if someone find, and if the government finds out about that, they can say, well, all the billing that resulted from that relationship where you have not strictly complied is tainted and must be returned. And not only that, but if you have some, if, you know, God forbid you have someone in your organization who complains about it, feels like an appropriate remedy hasn't been taken and becomes a whistleblower and files a, a lawsuit in federal court, now all of a sudden, they're reporting that you violated that law. They're tying it to a violation of another law called the False Claims Act, which can result in, which actually itself has specific penalties for each violation. And each violation means each bill submitted. And then it also has mul multiplier damages on top. So it can be single damages, which typically never happens. You'll usually see double or treble damages then. So that's how you get up with these very high dollar value settlements. And for you know, smaller facilities, they don't want to put you out of business. That's probably one of the dirty secrets of this. But they will take the money, they will take their pound of flesh. So it's, you know, there's a very real uh, financial consequence to it. So I know from the compliance perspective, there's not necessarily that return on, or quantifiable return on investment where it's going to bring in more dollars. But from my view, compliance is helping keep the dollars that you've collected in your pocket as opposed to having to give it back at some point for you know, and what oftentimes can be what I argue is a technical violation, although from the government's perspective, you've either, you're either in compliance or you've violated. There's no such thing as a technical violation. And that's why I wanted you to hear that piece, because to the extent that, once again, if Medicare shows up because of this or anything else, they're showing up for everything, so you want to make sure that you're set. Yeah, and then, thank you. And then I just have one last plug. This is, ties into the compliance, but HIPAA, which is another area that I deal with. Uh, 
you know, everyone, uh, how many heard about the new omnibus rule that was published last January that impacted a lot of um, changes to the privacy and security rules and change breach notification? So one, same guy. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a consultant? Do you do? But you're ah. <laughs> Yeah, so HIPAA is very important to make sure, again, you have appropriate policies and procedures in place because, and this is a good example that I can give because this one is stuck Quick out of Quick though, mind we want to keep these people on time. Very easily. There was a settlement announced on December 26th of a der small dermatology practice based here in Mass and Concord that had to pay $150,000 because they self-reported that they lost a thumb dr an unencrypted thumb drive and when uh, they reported that to the Department of Health and Human Services, and they came out and looked. They said, okay, you lost that, but the bigger problem here is you have no breach notification policy. You don't have all the required policies and procedures, and obviously, I don't represent them. I don't know what was going on, but they also took a long time after the government told them that to then still implement their policies and procedures. So as the government very hi much highlighted in its announcement about the settlement was, this is the first time someone's being penalized for not having these appropriate policies and procedures in place. And you can be sure that the government on all levels is looking for appropriate policies and procedures because they're very concerned that they want their money going to a place that is actually kind of following the straight and narrow. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. So um, here's your first case. Uh, and, and Linda Sullivan from uh, um, from Elder Care Resources are going to present the case. And what we'd like to do is we're going to take the individual cases and ask for any questions about those cases and then get to the next one. And if we, if we don't get to everything by 9 o'clock, we're going to stop. Because I think as I, it, we, I always want to make sure that people are leaving events if they're coming here on time. I know that we had scheduled for some extra time, but I want to make sure that we're done by 9. Linda. I think Debbie's going to present first. Oh, and Debbie's going to present first. Yes. Deb Gittner. The first case, um, I, I want to give you some background information first. This client was able to manage at home. She was living at home with a wound until it became infected. She had services in her house from the ASAPs, plus she paid privately for some home care services. This client was able to transfer from bed to wheelchair by herself, and she was able to propel herself throughout her home. She had a very supportive family who visited during the week. They food shopped, and they oversaw her services. Family members took this client to the physician, and they also filled her pill box, which she was able to then take on a daily basis. The family realized the wound was infected and they took her to the emergency room when they noticed the infection and they noticed that her mother had a fever. She was hospitalized for three midnights for wound care and the goal is for her to return home. From the hospital, she then went to a rehab setting. Actually, in this case, um, I want to let you know um, that due to this infection, she had a big change in her diabetic status. Her uh, sugar levels were way out of control, which was probably contributing to the wound problem as well as the infection. What I'm basically going to talk about is pre-GMO. In this case, um, she would have met the qualifications to go on Medicare and stay skilled. She did go into a long-term care setting post-hospital due to her need for um, maintenance of her diabetes. She was on a sliding scale. The infection was such she was receiving IV antibiotics. They had done some um, medical debridement of the wound and she was going to need to have more of that done. I think that always in my time in long-term care, documentation has always been what drove your skilled nursing because if anybody came in to audit, the first thing they look at is your documentation. I think under GMO, what happens in these cases is um, her skilled care is going to be not to make her better, but to maintain and try to prevent relapse. And in order to do that, some skilled teaching is definitely going to be needed to be done once she's met the requirements for discharge. 
Therapy will see her probably for OT um, to get her back going, doing her ADLs and working with her for positioning because obviously she's got a pressure problem on the coccyx area which initially caused the wound. The wound is chronic but now we're looking at a brand new situation with the debridement and the infection process. The nursing is going to be skilling her for her IV antibiotics her uncontrolled diabetes along with um, the progression of uh, the wound. And I think therapy uh, would continue to keep her on to get her back to where she was prior to this infection. The issue here is the documentation needs to be made aware, the doctor needs to be aware that when he writes the order that he's also involved or she's also involved in that plan of care. They're seeing what we're writing and they're seeing what's supposed to be done. So if you get to a point where the doctor is writing, well, she's ready and I think she's back to where she was um, and the nurses are writing that she may have to go back in to get a second debridement, things are not looking well with the wound. So. I think that in this case, um, and I will say that documentation to do it appropriately needs to be reviewed all the time. Some facilities may have a wound nurse. The wound nurse is in, you know, maybe doing the wounds during the daytime, but maybe overseeing what's being done on the evening and the day shift. So again, it's making sure someone is following that documentation. Same thing in rehab, making sure that everything you wrote in that plan of care is followed through.